PogChamps is one of Chess.com's most popular events. Kicking off their fifth season yesterday, this event features 16 heavyweight creators and celebrities who are also amateur chess players, playing rapid games for content, laughs, and a chance at a piece of a $100,000 prize fund. This year, Chess.com is partnering with the one and only Ludwig to also bring you an in-person finals in sunny Los Angeles. So because these games are played by amateur level chess players, there is a lot to learn from their errors, and I'll be taking you through them. For the first analysis, I will be taking you through Gotham Chess's star student Francis here and his game versus Jarvis Johnson. Frank made an amazing comeback, so let's get into it. So Frank was playing black, and the two start off in not the most normal opening setup, but it's still playable. And on move four, Frank decides to trade off his dark score bishop for the knight. Which, personally, I don't think is the best trade, because he's giving up quite a powerful bishop for a knight that's just developed and isn't causing any harm, but that's beside the point. After this trade-off happens, Frank plays the move d takes e4, which is a big blunder. A habit that I notice a lot with lower rated players is once they decide to go for a trade and that sequence of trades is over, they kind of conclude that idea and move on to their next idea without really paying attention to the final position after pieces have been traded off. But you can never just end there. You have to apply the basic questions of what do you ask yourself when your opponent makes a move with every move regardless of the position or what just happened. For example, Frank went for this trade off here, which is fine. But now that the bishop is on c3, what is that bishop attacking there? What's it looking at when it's in a different square? Well, if we look down the entire board, it's attacking this pawn in g7, which is a really important pawn that Frank does not want to lose because if he loses this pawn, this rook is trapped. So sometimes after a recapture, it's just a simple recapture and your opponent might not have any threats but it always depends on the positioning of their pieces. So whenever your opponent makes a move, no matter what the purpose of it was, always ask yourself, did they move to a safe square and what is their threat? So Frank did not ask himself that question and did not realize that this pawn on g7 was hanging. So now as we proceed further along the game, black just ends up down a full rook. But obviously anything can happen. So playing on is a correct decision. And then we get on to move 10, where Jarvis decides to play the move knight to h4. Now hopefully you've heard of the phrase, knights on the rim are grim, because this is a perfect instance as to when that quote is true. From a first glance, this move is doing absolutely nothing. The knight cannot move to this g6 square, cannot move to this f5 square. He's trapping his knight on the corner of the board, and the only reason that I see fit for playing this move is because he wanted to open up the diagonal for his queen, which is a good try by him. However, he's throwing his knight on a very, very bad square, not prioritizing development of his pieces or king's safety, and he's allowing Frank an amazing move in this position. Always be looking for your forcing moves first. The order of forcing moves are checks, captures, and threats. So if you're black in this position and you're looking for a safe check, what's the only check that black can play in this position? The answer is queen to b4 check. And not only is this a check, but Frank is also able to take back the knights. And because Frank did not have tunnel vision, he was able to see this until the capture, which is amazing. It's very common to have tunnel vision in chess. You're so focused on a certain area. So for him to see this check and look at the entire board all the way across and notice that the knight was hanging is a sign of good board vision. So the game continues. Move on, playing some normal moves. Now when we get to a position like bishop d7, if I was playing white here, I would immediately prioritize castling. You want to get your king safe. The king is stuck in the center of the board and White's pieces are not really in sync. However, White decides to play the move f4, hitting the queen, and after queen d5, which is forking the rook and the pawn, instead of castling again, which would have been a nice option, getting that king safe, and then maybe putting the bishop on this diagonal, so you get the queen out, and you defend this long diagonal. White decides to play the move rook to f1. Now with this move, White's still continuing to break these basic principles, leaving the king in the center of the board, and now there's no option to castle on either side. 
Black's grabbing any material that he can back to make up for being down at the exchange now, and White continues to just kind of push pawns blindly. Now Jarvis plays the move f5, which I think is a big error in the game. We talked about the fact that the king is stuck in the center and White can literally not castle on either side anymore. So when your king is stuck in the center of the board, the last thing you want to be doing is opening up the center of the board. Because black is castled, black's been getting back material, black's rook has easy access to this e-file the minute pawns are traded. So this is a big error for white, allowing this e-file to be open, this diagonal for the king is open, and there's no safe square for the king to lie on. And it only gets worse because after queen d5, white plays bishop to g4, which I understand this move is played to defend this pawn. However, it's opening up the king. And if we're weighing what's more important, it's more important to give up the pawn or find another way to defend this pawn than to play a move that defends the pawn while completely opening up the e-file and exposing white's king. Frank capitalizes on the opportunity, controls the e-file, and after the king moves, plays an amazing move, knight to d4 controlling a ton of squares around white's king, improving the positioning of his knight. This is an outpost. The knight has an outpost on d4, and white's king is basically just trapped. The bishop on h8 is trapped as well. This bishop on g4 is just stuck behind this pawn, and white's king is definitely in a lot of danger. White plays queen f4, and now it's kind of open season on white's king. Now, this is a good attempt on white because when they play queen a4, He's threatening checkmates. However, while they're threatening checkmates, they're allowing black to force a checkmate. Pause the video here to try to find the checkmate sequence. This isn't easy to find at their level. However, if you break it down move by move and you're just trying to find the forcing moves in a position, it might make it easier to find the sequence. So again, when we look for forcing moves, we look for checks first. Now, if I scan the safe checks in the position, I come up with queen b3 check and I come up with bishop to a4 check. Now, if I'm deciding which one do I want to calculate first, I'm probably going to lean more towards queen b3 check because it's a check with a stronger piece and I'm forking the king and the pawn at the same time. So if I play queen to b3 check, there's only one safe move for white, which is to bring their king forward. Now, speaking of the pawn that we were forking, we can just simply take it. And because this rook is so powerful on the e-file, rook c2 is forced, and now black can just take the rook, and it's a checkmate in three moves. So at first glance from this position, it might not be the easiest checkmate to spot. Frank ended up playing bishop to a4 check, which is definitely still strong, white's still winning, however it doesn't really force a checkmate. So the minute you see a check, don't just go and play it. Try to scan what your other options are and where they could lead. Try to calculate at least two to three moves ahead if you can. So even though this doesn't really force a checkmate, given the moves that Jarvis played, he did not hang on for long. So after a few moves here, Frank was able to checkmate his opponent. And overall, this was an amazing comeback for Frank. He was down an entire rook, but he was not blinded by tunnel vision and he spotted an amazing fork, allowing him to recapture the knight, which only made him down in exchange. Then he made sure to develop his pieces and get his king safe and capitalized on his opponent's lack of development and exposing their king to start this really strong attack and eventually converting into a checkmate. So this was a great lesson that at most levels, being up a piece does not determine the result of the game at all, definitely still play and fight on, but it shows the importance that no matter how much material you are up or down, the benefits of following the basic principles, such as development, king safety, making sure pieces are defended and working together, which is all so crucial to follow regardless of the position. And from his opponent's point of view, it shows you what happens when you don't follow those basic principles. So I hope you guys enjoyed this analysis and let me know if you would like more. Bye-bye.